Thank you for listening to the Plain State Podcast by the Department of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In this episode, Janine Capo-Cruset, author of the newly published essay collection, My Time Among the Whites, Notes from an Unfinished Education, sits down with Hope Wabuki to discuss the writing process, giving good feedback during the writing process, collegiality, and the role of family. Hi, I'm Janine Capo-Cruset. And I'm Hope Wabuki. Um, and we're here to just have a conversation uh, about writing and about the process of putting a book together, a manuscript together, all sorts of different genres. Um, I am primarily a fiction writer, but my latest book is a work of nonfiction, a collection of essays called My Time Among the Whites, Notes, from an, unfinished, <laughs> Notes from an Unfinished Education. It's fantastic. It's awesome. And Hope, you want to talk a little bit about what you do? I write poetry and essays. And I try to just kind of be a good literary citizen and try to write about books that are awesome, mostly by women of color, people of color. Um, and I'm just really excited about Janine's new book, My Time Among the Rights. So Hope read this. It's a little weird to think about who we're talking to. So I think I'm just going to talk yeah. to you yeah. and not think about yeah. who's listening. That's great. Uh, so you've read this when it was a mess of pages, right? Like you read this when I printed it out and handed it to you like full of tears being like, make my book better. Actually, uh, it was not a mess. <laughs> it was brilliant. It was, it blew me away. I was so happy this book was going to exist in the world because it's something that I haven't come across and needed to be said. And that's kind of, maybe I love you because you really live in my head. Like <laughs> I remember when I read your novel, um, Make Your Home Among Strangers. And I just thought, this is my life. Like, yeah, I'm a Cuban American girl from Florida. No, <laughs> but like, I was also a first generation um, student. I, my parents immigrated here. I had that whole history. I also went to a PWI, mm -hmm. a predominantly white institution. And pretty much the main character's experience there was like my experience. And I had been looking for that representation and not really fit, knowing I was looking for it. It just felt like such a gift that this book came to me. I'm like, this is my life on the page. And so when you said that you were writing this essay collection, I was just really excited because, you know, I, I guess I read and write a lot about literature of the African diaspora, so I know a lot of black writers who are writing essays and writing about their experience, but I hadn't yet um, read a book that was from the viewpoint of a Latino, you know, navigating race and culture, and I was just so excited that, you know, like that silly thing that Lena Dunham says on Girls, <laughs> like, I can be the voice of generation. Like, you actually are the voice. No, 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 don't you know? say that, because that's... It's it, pressure. It, it, it's, it's not true. that it's pressure. It's also, I think sometimes people can use that as a pass and say, well, we already have that voice of the generation. Mm. We don't need more voices. Yeah. And that's my, I yeah. think that's one of my fears with, um, with, with any career that I'm building or with this book is that it's... Um, that there's some writer coming up after me and they were like, well, we already have, you know, Ginny Kapoor said, so we don't need another Latinx voice. And it's like, no, there's a lot of um, diversity within that group. There's a lot of different politics and ideas. And uh, yeah. I mean, it, I hope it opens a door and I'm yeah. not trying to close it behind me, right? Like yeah. I'm trying to like get as many people in with me as we can, as we can fit in the house, you know, um, until we got to tear the house down <laughs> to fit more of us. So, um, but I think an interesting thing that maybe listeners would would, would want to know is uh, the process of writing this book and that uh, how being colleagues and that I've been a, a longtime admirer of your essays and your work um, and sort of you knew like when I saw that you were coming to Nebraska, I know you've been here for a little bit now, but when you were, I was like, oh my God, I hope we can hire her. She's brilliant. Um, and I, I, I see in your essays a lot of um, the kind of fearlessness that I was hoping to capture and so I was so grateful when you agreed to read the whole manuscript and give me your honest opinion and it was honest so I thought you were very honest um, and oh, pointed no, out bad no you were amazing because you pointed out things um, that you know honestly that that I think my editor who's a, who's a white woman and is a fantastic editor was afraid maybe to say to me because she from her position felt like, well, Janine's just this authority on this because she can speak for this group. Mm -hmm. And you didn't let me slide by with that, right? And I wasn't trying to slide by, right? But there is this, 
sometimes this fear, and I, I experienced this as an MFA student as well, where I had uh, my colleagues would say, the story's great. And I was like, I know that it could be better, but people were kind of afraid they would offend me or afraid they would say something offensive in their critique and maybe expose a moment of unintentional bigotry, right? They'd say something that would that make them look bad. And so it was better to just say nothing. And that meant that work went out into the world that maybe wasn't ready or it wasn't as good as it could be. Um, and I didn't want that to happen with this book. Uh, so yeah, I hope read the whole thing when it was a bunch of manuscript pages. And we can maybe talk a little bit about that process of what two writers working together looks like. I feel like I owe you big time, um, when, which is, I feel so bad because I'm not a poet, and when you hand me a book of poems, I'm just gonna be like, "These are amazing." I'm, why don't they rhyme? Uh, I mean, I'm not that bad, but uh, <laughs> that thought will cross my mind, and then I'll know not to say it uh, out loud. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just—I can only talk about how poems make me feel and what they leave me feeling. Not so much. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. How is the how is the manuscript? Like you're done working on it, right? It's just oh, my poetry manuscript. Yeah, yeah. I'm done with the first one, the body family, and the body family. Yeah, keep an ear out for it, everyone. Uh, it's, thank you. It's it's about my family's escape from Idi Amin's genocide in Uganda in 1976, and traveling to America and healing in America, but also kind of discovering. You know, they grew, they grew up around everybody who looked like them. Everybody was brown in their community, and coming here and uh, just kind of discovering America, which meant also discovering American racism. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have that history of. I think if you grow up in America as a black person, your parents have talks with you and kind of prepare you for this is what it's like. And they were just kind of dropped in it, mm -hmm. and they were trying to navigate. They had. You know, they just believed the rhetoric of America, which was like freedom and equality, and then coming here and realizing that that's not the same for everyone, mm -hmm. and that you know they had co the police car would always be parked watching my parents' house for like the first five years they lived here. Just mm -hmm. you know, just my dad was always followed, and this was you know this was in the, the late seventies, but. Yeah, I remember when I was, we were, it was in 1990 about, and I was, we were shopping for a graduation dress for me, and it was in LA, and they asked us to leave the store. So it, it's because we were making the other white shoppers uncomfortable. My hmm. dad had taken, you know, he wanted to get me a nice dress. We went to a nice store in a nice part of town, and, and that's what happens. And I think that, you know, your book, My Time Among the Whites, uh, why I keep coming back to just why I love it is because it articulates those experiences of when you're in a an community that is not full of everybody like you, but you're there whether through work or just, you know, you want to be a person living. And for a lot of people of color like us, if you're a person living in certain places, there may not be anybody who looks like you and right. it's, it's not safe. And how do you navigate that? I just think it's really funny that you say that I'm fearless in my writing because I feel like I am so afraid and I feel like you're fearless. No, I am also really afraid. Um, not all alone when I'm writing the thing, but then afterwards, like for instance, you know, this title, My Time Among the Whites, it was my joke title for the book for the <laughs> longest time because I was like every essay, like if you look, if you look through it, the essays are like, you know, what we pack and that's about being like being a first year college student and going to predominantly white institution. The title for the, the working title for that essay was My Time Among the Whites, right? And then Magic Kingdoms about sort of the, the role of fantasy and, and specifically about Disney World and how Disney World was this weird introduction into whiteness for a kid from South Florida like me. It was called My Time Among the Whites. And basically like going cowboy, the country now call home, ease of exit, all the essays, except for maybe one, they had this working title on my computer as My Time Among the Whites. And I was like, man, I wish I could call the book this. Um, and then I was like, well, why don't I? And then I was like, well, I don't, I don't know why not, other than, I, I don't know. I was trying to think about what kind of pushback it would get. And from some of the people that I spoke to, it was white folks that were, they just didn't like the idea of being thought of as the whites, right? This thing that you could interrogate. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that had to be the title because now more than ever, whiteness is at the forefront of everything going on in our um, like political discourse and it's For important sure. to interrogate it and investigate what is what about whiteness is encouraging 
all this violence and these mass shootings and all this really strong oppression of women, right? Like that's mm-hmm. at the root of all this in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. So it's interesting that most people, when I would say the title, if I was talking to a person of color, they would laugh immediately and they're like, I know exactly what your book is about, right? <laughs> and when white folks would say it, they would be like, oh, whoa, like, I, am I in it? Like every white person that I, like, or a lot of white people would be like, am I in the book? And I'd be like, yeah, you are. Because uh, then they'd go buy it, right? Uh, so, uh, but they like every white person I've ever met is in the book, so y- y'all should pick it up. Uh, but I think, like recently, you know, it comes out soon. So yesterday there was something about that I had tweeted about uh, being afraid of the essays in this book and to write them because it was sort of like laying out things that I believe in and giving arguments for those things and drawing upon literature and popular culture and movies and. Um, various like life experiences to sort of say like here's some concrete ideas I have about how we could learn to be better Americans and be better people towards each other right and it was this very sincere tweet which normally on Twitter I'm not trying to like be all about my feelings often but I was and immediately got this backlash from like on Twitter where it was like somebody saying like this title offends me hashtag white pride Oh my god. And I was like, oops, I didn't realize. But then I looked at the title, I was like, wait, why why would this be some offend somebody's sensibilities of white pride? If anything, it's a book about your folks, so why don't you check it out and see how you're doing? Um so I mean I know you can't con- control who is gonna read the book and who's not gonna read the book and uh but it was just to have to see immediately a white like a white pride hashtag mm-hmm. attached to the, to to this sincere effort at communicating and reaching out to people. I was like, oh, is this like a pattern that's going to... That is horrific. I hope yeah. the trolls don't come for you. That would be really scary for me. But I'm thinking about what you were saying, and I think it's because it's like whiteness isn't really used to looking at itself. Mm-hmm. It's always seen as the default normal, and then you're looking at the other people as other. Like you have books about different races, the blacks, the Asians, the Latinas, whatever, but you never have, you know, but it's always from that focal point of the white gaze being seen as normal. And I think interrogating that is really important, especially as our society is so diverse and multi-layered and intersectional, and you know, that, that work needs to be done. And I think that we've there's a work been at looking at the others mm-hmm. as we try to you yeah know, as we try to make ourselves not othered but you know to to gain that space of center. But I think interrogating whiteness is important. I think that for example, looking at the history and and what slavery did to this country and Jim Crow and racism, um, which the fantastic 1619, the 1619 project, project I'm so excited yeah. about. But, you know, I also think it's important to look at the reverse of that. Like, not just what did slavery do to black people, but what did slavery do to white, to white people. white people, absolutely. And I think if you have, like, 300 years of this country of being, you know, oppressed and violated and, and raped and sold and seeing your family sold and, you know, not having agency to your body or mind or, fam- or spirit or anything, that does something. But the question I'm really interested in now is what did that do to the white people? Mm-hmm. 300 years of violence and oppression and and raping and selling off your kids to somebody else just because they were brown to get money for yourself. And why wouldn't white folks be interested in that yeah. question? That's what's so so strange to me yeah. because I, I think they're afraid of the answer. Yeah, completely. It's why we don't have, you know, we haven't dealt with slavery. There's been no apology, no record, no reparation. You know, the, for the first time this year um, is when we have, or say it was last year, when we have the Museum of Lynching that mm-hmm. opened up and everybody was saying, why? Why do you want to go see that? It's important. It's important to go and see those hanging um figures that look like bodies. It's important to read that, you know, Mary Turner was strung up and lynched and that they cut out her unborn baby and bashed the baby's head against a tree and that this was in the 20th century, mm-hmm. you know? And in Germany, they have Holocaust memorials. They, they reckon with it. They're not going to repeat it. Here, mm-hmm. I think a lot of the rise of white supremacy, sorry, I don't want to say rise of white supremacy. I want to say rise of emboldened white right, supremacy. Right, because it's been here. It's been here. It's just, ha- it's just had to kind of hide under the surface. But now there's this idea that it's okay to be, um, you know, loud and proud with your racism and white supremacy because that's what we see in the culture. And I think it's because we haven't reckoned with this history, what it did to everybody who was involved, not just the people who received the violence, but the people who who perpetuated the violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
again, that's why I think your book is so amazing because, you know, you're reckoning with this ideas, but it's with humor, it's with grace, it's with gentleness, it's with kindness, it's with, you know, ferocious intelligence, and it's all through your particular language and point of view, which is just such a joy to read your work, you know. I'm just so glad you exist in the world, Janine, because you write things. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but it's also why I won't, like, translate to Twitter, right? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like it doesn't give it easy answers because yeah. there are none. So yeah. let's stop pretending that we'll come to them. I know, uh, so my mom read the book. Oh, wow. What was that like? she's, I don't, we don't talk about my work very often, but I thought it, since it's a work of nonfiction and my parents appear in the book in several essays, um, I thought it was important for me to send them a copy once, you know, once ARCs, or advanced reading copies existed. So they've had it for a couple months. And you know, my mom, I left, I was, I visited, I left it with her, and then we didn't talk about it. We talked on the phone, it wouldn't come up. And then recently she sort of was like, okay, so I read your book. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank you. I didn't ask what you think. I was like, thank you yeah. for reading it. I didn't want to know really, because, I, you know, she said, well, I think you and I remember some stuff differently, mm. but I can see why you remember the things you remember the way you do. And then we moved quickly past that and got to, she was like, She's like, there were things that you wrote about in that book that have happened to me. And they always made me feel so bad. But I never knew to understand. I never understood that what was happening to me was a racist thing. Mm. I just, and she talked specifically that about. That sounds like my parents. Yeah. That, that when you move to a country and you don't know how to read what's happening. And you're like, why is this happening? And it takes understanding that this is how racism is expressed in this country. Yeah. And she, I mean, she just started telling me stories. She was like, this happened to me too. And I, I just, it makes me feel bad, but I always thought, well, that's my fault for not rolling with it rather than, mm. you know, letting that feel bad. I think specifically like her generation, right? Like having come to the United States um, as, a, as a young, as a younger person mm -hmm. and growing up more comfortable uh, well, comfortable in both languages, but essentially an American, right? Like she, she's lived way more years in the United States than she has than she had in Cuba, at this point. Um, and so it was just interesting. And she's like, she reads, she read it, and she sort of told me that um, she was surprised that I was able to do it and st and stay classy. Those were her mm. words. She was like, I don't know, I, I'm, you know, you're the writer, I'm not the writer, but the word I would say is like, it's just classy. Oh my gosh, like, she called you Beyonce. <laughs> and I was like, yay! She's like, it's just classy. She's like, you see people throwing, saying nasty things to each other, and you could have easily done that. Like, I know you know how to do that, but you didn't do that, you stayed classy. And you would write this whole thing, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at some point, I'd you'd like turn it, and I'd go, oh, if I agreed with all this, then I also have to think this. It's just, she was like, it just was super classy. And I really appreciated yeah. her. Her, um, her putting it in those words because it made me. I, I was like, can I use that as a blurb? Like, <laughs> I know you can't, but it would be like, this is super classy. <laughs> Dash Janine's mom. Um, I know the publishers don't want blurbs from your parents, but uh, I don't know. It's something that comes up in the last essay that I think mm. ultimately I'm always writing for for them yeah. and trying to find the book that will speak to them, that will make yeah. them readers because they're not big readers. They're not. They don't turn to literature for comfort or for insight or anything. So I was like, how do I get them? How do I get them both on the page mm -hmm. and and in the page? Right? Like I want them yeah. to be people who see themselves in literature. And, and that's what I see as my charge. And I kind of came to that realization through the writing of that, the last essay in the book, uh, which is so much better because of you. Can I just say, you no, were the one who put- No, I didn't no, do that anything. Whole, no, this you, is all you. Have you, read the, have you read it since? I don't know if you've yeah, had a chance. Yeah, I added all those scenes you told me were missing. <laughs> um, so initially the essay, you know, the essay sort of grapples with um, the complicated uh, um, and difficult relationship I have with my, with my father. Uh, among other things, that's like a small element yeah. of it, but it's one of the threads. And I was so reluctant to just sort of like show that relationship. I just kind of wanted to tell it and have the reader believe it. And you had said, you know, you need you need to be in your body more in this essay. Like you need yeah. to talk about a moment how it felt in your body to be having this conversation with someone. Or and you pointed out the whole essay. The other threads of it are so visceral. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of like throwing up in this essay <laughs> and you're like how do you you know it's a real it's a stark contrast of how you're not willing to go there mm -hmm. when it comes to talking about your father and so then I, tr I really tried to get there and the essay I would say it almost doubled in length after that and I didn't add any new 
thematic elements. I just, every place that I was afraid that you were like, don't be afraid. You need to say it this way so that the reader feels it too. And I went back, and even the, the whole beginning of that essay changed with that comment from you. You were like, just, just slow it down and stay in your body. And it was such good life advice and also writing advice. So that essay is, is thank you, Hope, for making all that the essay yoga. better. Okay, from California, it's all the yoga <laughs> and that we do. So I uh, had the very awesome experience of getting to be the narrator for the book, mm-hmm. for the audio book here. What was that um, like? It was so hard. It was so much harder than I thought it was going to be. I mean, I'm a pretty good reader. I enjoy giving readings. I make eye contact. I memorize parts. You know, I'll do the voices or whatever. I thought, oh, I got this. I go in there and, like, I'm reading the first paragraph, and the producer just stops it. He's like, you're giving a reading. You're not narrating. And I was like, oh, I don't know the difference between those two things. I don't know the difference between those two things. Well, it turns, he, he put it in terms that I could understand. He was a great producer. I was, we were very lucky to find somebody here locally in Lincoln who was able to work with the, um, the person who makes the audiobooks out in New York. Um, they, the, this guy, he told me, he's like, if you feel like you're just teetering on cheesy, you're doing it right. And I was like, no way. And it's true. He, you have to kind of, as you're reading, you open your eyes and you talk like this, and it sounds your voice changed. Yeah, but your it voice sounds, changed when you do But that. it sounds better, even though it sounds horrible in the moment as you're saying it. Like this is, I don't know. It's, but you're also trying to capture a sense of your own personality. But you'd be surprised. It was. A, I thought it was a given when you publish a book of nonfiction that you narrate your own audiobook because why would an actor read your words? Not the case. So this is a, this for when your book of essays comes out. You got to make sure you get your agent to get it in the contract that you are the narrator for the audiobook because that's what we did with this one. Was it hard um, to get that? In it was. Your it was pretty hard because it's true though they don't know what they're getting. Like just because someone is a is is a writing a manuscript that's publishable doesn't mean that they're the best person to narrate it. And I didn't narrate my novel. Uh, oh, you didn't? No, I didn't. And I wish I could have because it? Uh, I don't remember the name of the actress who did it. Mm. Uh, friends of mine that have listened to it have said it's good. She sounds like she's doing an impression of you giving a reading. And I think that, I mean, I think that's a good thing because, again, I like giving readings. But there were small things like um, mispronunciations of things that would have been mm. easy to sort of check. Uh, one funny thing that came up in this, in the reading of this, is there's a, an expressway that borders where I grew up and it's spelled G R A T I G N Y. I grew up calling that the Gritigny. Because I'm from Hialeah, and those are all the letters, and you say them. Turns out it's pronounced Gratney, right? <laughs> it's, and it's a French last name, and that is named after somebody. So I'm reading it, and I'm like, blah, 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 the Gratigny Expressway. And the guy stops it, and he's like, it's pronounced Gratney. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not pronounced Gratney. It's pronounced Gratigny. And then he's like, all right, well, let's... Um, Let's do the research and figure this out. And it turns out that it's like a geographical difference. If you're from Hialeah and you are of a certain ethnic background, like mostly like Cuban and Spanish speaking people, we say Gratigny because we saw it on the sign and we're like Gratigny. But people who are like predominantly English speakers will say Gratigny. And also people from outside of Hialeah. So if you're from a different part of Miami and you're driving through, you know to call it the Gratigny. But even people on New shows will say that there's a traffic jam on the Gratigny or a traffic jam on the Gratigny. Uh, so I went down in my audiobook as Gratigny forever, so people know that where I'm from. <laughs> but even every time I had to say, it was funny how many words that as soon as I had to say them out loud, I did not know how to pronounce them correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, isn't that funny? Like because I feel like you're like me. You read all your life, and you like started reading really early and you read everything. And there's book, there's words that I know because I've read them and I read them, but I've never actually said aloud. And then it mm-hmm. comes to say them and I'm like, what? I think it took me like 10 years and I couldn't understand like orchard versus orchard, mm-hmm. you know? And um, yeah, just things like that. Yeah, another word I stumbled on in the audiobook was D-O-S-S-I-E-R. Oh, dossier. Yeah, I was like, dossier. And he was like, whoa, that one I'm not going to let you get away with. And I was like, I realized I'd never said that word out loud. And it was interesting to me because my parents mispronounce words all the time. Mm -hmm. And I never equate it. 
because of that, because, you know, English is not their first language. Yeah. So my mom says salmon yeah. all the time. She says tangy for mm -hmm. tangy. She's like, oh, the sauce is too tangy. I can't eat it. And I just, I'm like, yeah, because you, when you come from a Spanish background, like Spanish-speaking background, you just say all the letters. Yeah. Um, and I heard enough people speaking like that that it became normal. It sounds yeah. normal to me. Yeah. And it just made me think about how, like, the, the challenge of recording the audiobook means I was making a choice. Mm. Do, I, do I sound like myself or do I sound like a, like a version of myself that has been put through a process by which all that got quote unquote cleaned up that's so profound that's like a metaphor for your book and life well that's what I was like I just like writing it down so other people can do it um yeah. <laughs> I just because I know yeah. I know it, I didn't know it was dossier I realized mm -hmm. I hadn't said it out loud and I think I think I thought when other people would say dossier it was like their preference to say it that way because yeah. then why is that are there if you're not going to say it like, this I is again the Spanish from, influence yeah, like it's from French like when I because I studied French in high school instead of Spanish like I should have because no. I was growing up in LA there's no shit they're I all never good language used my ones. French so I've forgotten most of it but I just in French you learn that the, if it's a French word IER it's usually like pronounced a certain way and so and they and then the British pronounce it differently. They they refuse to pronounce certain French words French because of the whole British French rivalry. So my parents, you know, my my words were all messed up when I was growing up because my parents came from two different African tribes, so they spoke two different languages. But then English was the national language, but British English, but British English taught by with a kind of African accent. And then they came here, and then we were in the Midwest for a second, and then California, which is the whole Valley Girl thing. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like my, my language is just a mishmash. When I was younger, I sounded a lot like my parents. And then people would tease me going, why do you have a British accent? You're American. But I'm like, well, I'm learning how to speak from my parents. And then I actively changed the way I spoke. Um, I did that too. Was know, it college? I wanted to fit in. It started. It started around high school when I yeah. noticed that people would ask me to say certain things and laugh at me, and then they would, I got a lot of because I grew up among the whites. Mm -hmm. I was the, we were the only black family to move into that town. Um, they would like ask me to say things and then laugh at me, and then it, I got a lot of you don't sound black. You need to talk more black. And then I think maybe that's why I turned to writing because I just felt like. Oral, the oral space was not safe. There yeah. would always be somebody policing how I sounded and wanting me to sound differently, and I could be myself on paper. Um, but it's, it's just such a, there's a lot of privilege and weirdness based upon how people are judged, based upon how they talk. And when I got to college and I was taking my first poetry workshop, um, you know, it was all about stressed, unstressed syllables yeah. and sketch, and that's what they were really into. And you know, I heard things differently because we pronounce things differently. Right, right. And it turned me away from poetry for a long time until I realized that I could enter poetry in a space that's not about that. And you know what's ironic about all this is that you and I now live in the state that everyone talks about as having the it's unaccented perfect English, right? Like the it's broadcaster, right? Isn't that what? something? I've heard this that like Nebraska's there's no it's the it's accentless, right? The Nebraskan English is what you want your, like, I think it's called like broadcasters English or something like that. It's like what you want your TV personality speaking. And I have noticed that it'll, it has like impacted how, like living here has impacted, I mean, I think it's called sort of like code switching, but mm -hmm. I just have less reason to switch back to how I would normally speak, right? Yeah. So it's interesting to me, like as I was reading the book for the audio book, I would, like slip into like speaking like how I grew up talking yeah, yeah. and the producer would like gently bring me back because he's like look for consistency you know you started in this very sort of academic professorial talk, like accent which not mm -hmm. it wasn't like that and, and he's like but now you're sort of drifting into talking like you're from Miami and I, I was like well then we need to go all the way back because I am from Miami and that's the natural way of talking and the other thing is a bit of a performance and I need to I need to read a paragraph before you start recording so that I get there faster. It was a really interesting process to, mm -hmm. but the idea, it was a literal thing of like, what is your voice? Mm -hmm. And how, and keeping it consistent over, you know, a couple hundred pages of reading. Uh, we did it over several sessions too. So you keep stopping and then you mm -hmm. come back and you're like, what did mm -hmm. we talk about last time? Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was, I mean, it was a really cool thing to do. I hope I get to do it again. And I like mad respect for all the people who do that kind of narration because it is not easy. Mm -hmm. What is the difference for you between writing essays and writing fiction? 
uh, writing fiction and writing nonfiction? Like w difference which one in do you what love? Way? Like which one's more? What do you like about each? Do you like one more? Oh man, it's a hard question. I'll try to answer really honestly, which I might regret later. <laughs> um, I found the essays came more easily than the fiction, mm. and what I mean by that is. I, I had the material. I already knew what it had to be about. Mm -hmm. I knew I, it would take turns I wasn't anticipating, and all of a sudden I'd be referencing something I didn't know or um, you know, telling a story that I wasn't aware was going to find its way in. But it was more about exploring how I thought about things. And it felt, it, it felt really cool, but I also felt like what I'm doing is exercising my intellect and my humor and putting that down on the page. Fiction, I mean, they're both a kind of discovery, but with fiction, I don't know. I didn't know what was coming. I don't think about what it's about. And I found it. I find fiction not harder to write, just a different challenge, right? Mm -hmm. A different part of my brain is being uh, prodded with the work of fiction. And to be honest, I was like, this book, this book of essays came a lot faster than and any you novel. It in like less than a year, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, and, and I think because in some ways, I would equate it more to like short stories, mm -hmm. right? Which my first, my very first book is a collection of short stories. And you could finish a story in a weekend, mm -hmm. right? You can't finish a novel in a weekend. No. You could also finish an essay in a weekend. Yeah. So I think it was just so, after having written a novel, it was so nice to come to a form where I could hold the thing in my hand, mm -hmm. print it out, hand it to my brilliant friend, <laughs> beg her to make it better, get a ton of notes, and then just do that nine times, right? Like, the, yeah. And then the book is complete, right? And there were essays that I wrote that obviously didn't end up in the book uh, as, as the thematic concerns started to present themselves. But I think fiction will always be my first love, uh, but I'm definitely not done writing nonfiction. I think it's uh, a, it feels like a very natural fit and you know, still writing for the New York Times, so as long as they'll have me, uh, I will keep telling the truth and uh, seeing where it takes us. I hope so. Your essays are amazing. Oh, thank you. This has been so fun talking with you, Hope, and thank you, whoever you are out there listening to our conversation. Uh, don't tell anybody what you heard, though. <laughs> <laughs> Special thanks to Janine Capo Crissette, Associate Professor of English, and Hope Wabuki, Assistant Professor of English. Plain State is produced by Robert Lipscomb. Post production by Stephen Ramsey. Music by Shadows on a River. I'm Katie Schmidt Henson. On behalf of the Department of English at the University of Nebraska, thank you for listening to the Plain State podcast. Tagline forthcoming. <laughs>